recording the session as well and i think we can get started because we are one minute behind time so good evening to everyone and thanks a lot for joining us uh, i'm mayur i'm one of the co-founders of green collective and we have some amazing community members from green collective today with us brand owners social change makers working in different parts of asia and working with a group which is well not that much talked about alongside COVID-19 and the impact it's having on uh, households across Asia. Um, but it does impact. It does impact a huge amount of those. And they are one of the biggest uh, employment employers in Asia. And we're going to talk about them today. So this session is about how the artisan economy or the maker economy in Asia has been affected by the COVID-19 crisis, how they're coping with us. And we have uh, three community members from the Green Collective, Matesai, Handmade Romantics, and Desi Hangover. Those are the brands. And we have the founders of those brands over here telling us about how it's, the impact has been and uh, what they have been doing and telling us a bit about the ground reality. So I'll take a minute or two just to tell you a bit more about the Green Collective. Uh, our vision at Green Collective is to basically empower a community of change makers to live and eat responsibly. We have a retail presence in Funan, which is, of course, not working right now. <clears throat> but we are always looking to basically grow the community of brands and work as a collective of sorts, which brings uh, sustainability to your doorsteps with a vision to make it as mainstream as anything else. Uh, we, of course, are completely aligned with the UNSTG goals, and so is every brand that will be presenting to you today, and the other 40 of them which are a member at the Green Collective, and uh, which is why this discussion is very, very important to me uh, as well as to all these brands present because we are looking at at least one or two of these goals uh, in our everyday lives and while building our brands. So uh, the structure of the webinar would be that the brands individually will be talking about what their work is about, their community, and in brief about how this has impacted the artisan community in their particular region. Uh, we, you can keep asking the questions during the session and we will take it at the end of the session. Uh, and we will basically try to uh, cover as many questions as we can during this session. So uh, this session is being recorded just for you to know. And it is also running on our Facebook Live of the Green Collective Facebook page. So if you have questions uh, and if you're seeing this on Facebook Live, feel free to ask questions there. So I had promised everyone that I will not be taking too much time and I'm going to stick to that. So we'll get started with Emmy from Matesai and uh, uh, followed by Steph and Lakshit. Um, Emmy, you can get kick started with this and tell us about how COVID has impacted the community and in your case, I guess it's specific to Laos. So over to you to talk about this. Okay, well, Matasai has been around for about 10 years, which makes it um, a bit easier at this time to cope. I think we're, the difference for us is that we're hitting our low season in tourist anyway. So at, by March, April, we are slowing down our production and um, all the weavers are used to that, all the makers are used to that because the tourists have basically wind it down anyway this this year there's just none <laughs> so um just from an overall perspective of laos one thing that you have to remember it's a very agrarian community so uh at this during these sorts of time people just go back to the fields and even in the urban centers like the wampa bang people with with uh, uh, a lot of people have gardens outside and they will go and plant whatever food they can to minimize their costs so we don't have a lot of uh, urban poor our makers in general are usually quite successful uh, agricultural economy, like they have the economy and then we're the secondary economy. So um, for our main makers, say in Northern Luwampaba, they, um, their village got basically shut down. Uh, and this happened to villages all around Laos. They didn't have any transport, no one going in and out of the villages. The village chief would control the village. And as we've been opening up, um, we're fortunate because we actually had some orders cancel and then they, uh, one large order from uh, America, actually we 
uh, ignited after things started opening up. So I was going to go to the village to actually uh, help reignite that and make sure we had the order correct. But the Naibam, well, the weaver, the weaver called me and said, oh, the Naibam, which is the village chief, he um, doesn't want you to come. They don't want foreigners. And I said, but we're opening up, you know. And he said, no, they don't want you to come. They said, if we, if we want to come, we have to meet in the local school up the road. And I said, well, then I won't come because I don't want to be seen as this foreigner uh, impacting uh, the security measures that you're taking in these villages. I feel very uncomfortable. So we just did it all via WhatsApp. Um, and luckily, we've been working with all these weavers a long time. We had a, for this order, we spread it out, um, mainly because we knew it was times, times were tough. So the way we handled it is we gave a little bit of work to everybody, which we thought was the best way to deal with it. Um, and they are busy doing that. Um, it's not a lot of work, but they're happy to have that work. The other thing we've done with this village is uh, some of our wholesale uh, people, like we had a customer in Korea, she said, oh, let me see what fabrics they have in the village and um, if we can help, we will. So we got them to send the photos of the fabric. Uh, then because we're 10 years old in Luwampa Bang and in Laos, we've often worked with many development agencies over the past to help train our artisans, and to raise funds to develop new products, to gain income for our artisans, um, and skills training, things like that. So uh, during this time, I've been busy applying for funding to assist. And the first funding that we've confirmed is through the Asia Foundation, and that is to continue a project with uh, Pultai in Savannakhet. Um, so the Pultai people, they weave these wonderful ikats, and we work with Seng Savang there to uh, sew uh, our, pro our product. And Seng Savang is a, is a center for women at risk of trafficking. So they have about 30 girls at the center. So of course, during COVID, they're struggling. Um, so what we've done for this project is we, we're looking at designing and um, exporting for the European market. So we're looking at homewares and so part of the project requirements is that this, uh, this year we had to try and start to get the range together and also look at production issues that we're going to have if we're going to scale up production in sewing in Seng Samang, but also things like fibre issues or dye issues that might be um, difficult for the European market as we have to start labelling our products and uh, with a lot of detail that we don't necessarily do even for Green Collective at Singapore, we don't have a huge amount of detail on what our components are. Um, what we, we, we sometimes don't know if they're actually always using natural dyes. So this is the sort of work we, we were going to go to Savannakhet to do, to really um, gain knowledge so that we could create this range and grow our market for these, not only the centre, but the village. So through this funding now, we, we've got the funding, so it means that we can complete we, we can, this is the four year project, so it means that we can actually do year one. So we'll be heading to Savannah Cat in June because the company didn't have funds to actually travel and there's a couple of us involved in this project. Then the second project um, that we've put in for funds is with Lux Development and it's for, uh, we've worked before with many communities up in Long Nampa, way north. And the one community, the Taideng community, we've been doing, um, some fantastic fabrics with. And the other one is the Lantern community, that they hand sew everything. And the Tidean community don't sew much at all. They sew a small bag. So they actually approached me and said, uh, we would like to um, do more sewing uh, and I would like them to finish products. My whole thing is that with the village in Northern Lampabang, we train three women to sew, we finish everything in the village. And that's really important to me. So I was really happy that they said this in this sewing, in this center, this weaving center. So um, the project that I put in for was we developed this through a local girl here. We've got a trainer who, it's very hard to get women to travel in Laos to work. So I found a young woman who can sew and has worked in projects, speaks English and Lao. So she will uh, accompany me for um, a trip first and then we'll go and set up a sewing centre, get the machines in, 
and we're looking at training people from about four or five ethnic communities so that they can start this whole process of sowing a better finished product in the villages up there for us and a, it's great for our business, but B, it's great for them. They'll be able to sell more directly to the tourist market. That funding um, hasn't been confirmed yet, but it's highly likely because we've done the project before with this, this organisation, it's highly likely we should get it and we should know next month about that. Um, so that's pretty much what we've been doing and also just working online to make sure that we can keep selling. So which is the most important thing, as you know, now, for all our, yes. all our people is to keep selling. I think that's, that's really informative. But um, uh, Amy, just to uh, give um, the audience a bit of background on Laos, because which is your main um, focus market in terms of the communities that you work with. And uh, you work through length and breadth of Laos, which is quite a lot, actually, which people don't tend to realize how... Mm longer country actually Laos is. Um, uh, does, does physical proximity, which has become one of the biggest challenges during these times, has that been a big challenge for you? What, what did you say? Sorry, the what? The, the, the physical proximity because traveling uh, and distancing has been an issue. Has that created challenges? Actually, um, be, well, I, apart from not being allowed in the village because I was you know, white, <laughs> which, um, you know, we're lucky that all our people work with uh, WhatsApp and we actually have been working remotely, like with Savannah Cat, um, because we work with Seng Savang there, we have um, a coordinator, Ted, in the, in the actual centre and she helps me coordinate with the village also. So... We actually have an amazing network. And what happened after COVID, uh, Laos actually had very few cases. So when we started opening up, one of the first, um, our post office is terrible. They've, they've done nothing to help, but um, the internal logistics companies have been quite good. And it's a new company that um, enabled us to send things to be done right away. Because um, we did have some work for Seng Savang also. I had some curtains someone had ordered. So, um, internally, getting stuff around and, and all that and physical proximity hasn't been such an issue for us because I think of our long-term relationships with our suppliers means that we've always been able to get around everything, you know. And we do, we like, we speak, I can speak Lao to the coordinate. The way the weaving groups work is there's always a, um, there's always a, There's always a coordinator and um, that coordinator will uh, organise the weaving for, you know, in general. So when I said I farmed out, I farmed out that order to like five different coordinators in that area. And they're the people I always work with. So I have many of these sort of, I don't know, I suppose they're nodes in the artisan group that, that they're, they're the one that facilitate everything for us and their quality control and everything. Okay, no, that, that, that sounds very sensible uh, as well because it helps you to reach out to many more people and create the impact in a much larger way. Okay, Amy, I think we'll move to Stephanie and get a view from Stephanie on Handmade Romantics. Uh, Stephanie, if you could appear. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, <Steph. laughs> Hi. So, so, Steph, I'll let you go ahead. Same format. So, all yours. I'm just going to share my screen so hopefully you can see it. Sorry, is it coming up? Uh, yes, it's coming up. Uh, I but can't see a really presentation. Weird way. Yeah. One second. Okay, right. So I think that's working. Uh, we still see the same screen, Steph. Oh, okay. One second. Sorry, I just went on to presentation mode. So let me just go on my screen. Okay, second try. <laughs> let me know if you can see this. Yes, perfectly fine. Okay, perfect. So um, I've just done a couple of slides just to give you an introduction into what we do. Um, I won't go through all the details, but we at Handmade Romantics. Um, so I work with artisan communities in Indonesia. Um, we have a range of products from uh, shoes, apparels, blah, blah. So 
because of that, we work with quite a wide range of communities across of Indonesia. And I guess just to give you a brief timeline of how COVID has impacted the country, um, there's been exposure first from February, and I won't go through in details, but essentially since then, um, there has been emergency uh, state declared. Um, approximately 39 billion Singapore dollars worth of money has been allocated towards combating uh, the pandemic and also relief funds. Um, and as of end of May, we've got over 23,000 people who have been tested positive. So in terms of the context of how that contrasts to Singapore, um, Indonesia has approximately 267 million people in their population. Um, so that's about 47 times of what we have here in Singapore. Uh, and that's spread across 900 inhabited islands. And that basically means that in terms of making sure that uh, policies such as social distancing or lockdown um, and as well as trickling of medical aid as well as relief funds, all of those become a lot more complicated and challenging when you've got a country as big as Indonesia. So the artisans that we work with right now, if you can see from the map on your bottom right corner uh, of the slide, if you ignore the, um, the red diamonds, because we don't carry jewelries anymore, we basically concentrate our efforts in Central and West Java. And we've got a couple of uh, groups of artisans that we work with there. And because of their proximity in the bigger cities, um, those bigger cities are, have been sort of the worst hit or the most initially hit by COVID-19 because of their exposure to international um, visitors and tourism. So our artisans are very much at risk. Um, at the same time, if you look at the news right now, or if you check out what's happening in Indonesia, you will see that while they have social distancing and lockdown um, policies in place, it's not always followed 100%. And that's, again, back to what Emmy said as well. Uh, the social structure and the makeup are quite different uh, to Singapore, where there's a lot of daily laborers in Indonesia, as I'm sure is in Laos and in India as well. So if you ask the people on the street why they are not following lockdown, um, a lot of time it's because if they don't go to work, they essentially get no money as, at all. So there's no such thing as insurance or furlough from uh, from the company or from the government. There are such schemes available, but they aren't always implemented um, accurately or efficiently in, in the society. Um, and also for these daily laborers, they're surviving on a day-to-day -day basis. So if they don't go to work, um, essentially that means no money for them. And that means also no food on the table for their families. Um, so if you ask a lot of the guys on the street why they're still outside of their homes, um, a lot of the feedback is that, well, if they don't go out to work, essentially that means no money. And they will be sooner, uh, essentially they and their family will sooner die from starvation and hunger as opposed to uh, from COVID-19. So it's becoming a very real problem for societies like Indonesia where it is uh, it's quite complex and the social structure doesn't always support uh, uh, a fallback method for, for, for our daily laborers. And our artisans also fall under that category. So I just want to walk you through a couple of the communities of artisans that we work with at the moment. Um, so we've got women weavers. Um, so these are the ladies that we work with to create our anti shake bags. So these are the bags here that you see. They're one of our best sellers. Uh, we actually work with women who are often housewives or girls. Um, uh, in sort of villages. So we work with a, a central Java village uh, for this. And um, these women normally do this kind of work as a side income to their household. So we really like working with them because what it means is it allows them to have some sort of income that supplements their husbands or their parents without having to leave their homes uh, and they can still take care of their families. We also have Batik artisan communities that we work with across central and west Java, depending on what sort of patterns we're going for. Um, so they work to create hand stamped fabric uh, for us and also because of social distancing right now, a lot of their work has had to stop since um, around April to May period, depending on where they are and how strictly the lockdown has been enforced. Uh, we also work with a group of shoe, traditional shoe craftsmen in West Java. Um, and again, I think they're sort of hit on two sides. So on the supply side, because we create batik shoes with them, uh, we haven't been able to actually give them the fabrics to work with because the Baltic artisans aren't able to produce them because of the lockdown. And obviously now because of social distancing as well, these guys aren't able to come into work. So I guess the common theme that you can see across the communities that we work with in Indonesia is that firstly, obviously there's loss of income. Um, 
there's a lot less tourism right now and also a lot of reduced local spending. Uh, it is currently high season or it's meant to be high season for, for retail in Indonesia, especially with Hari Raya just finishing last weekend. So normally in, in the good old days for the past month before Hari Raya, people would be buying a lot of clothing, a lot of new bags and items, um, and especially batik clothing as well, which is one of the traditional attire in Indonesia. Uh, but obviously that hasn't quite been happening this year because of the instability in incomes for the population. And if you think about like the price structure of different types of batiks out there. Um, so we have batik tulis, which is normally like the most expensive. So those are the hand-drawn batik. Um, those are the most expensive, followed by the hand stamp batik, which is a lot um, a lot less, a lot more affordable, but still slightly pricier than your printed machine printed batik. So if you think about um, how unstable the incomes have been for the majority of the population, um, people are now leaning more towards buying cheaper products as well, which means, again, hand stamp batik isn't always bought as much as they would have been bought in, in previous years. So we talked about um, the women weavers in central Java um, who are uh, essentially uh, supplementing the incomes that they have from their husbands. Uh, so their husbands would normally be daily laborers again, or people who are working in Jakarta, um, who are now possibly out of work again because of this. So again, they're being hit from both ends uh, in terms of their household income. Um, and relief support, while it is available from the government, it isn't always trickling down uh, in the right amount to the villages because you have the central government dealing with the local governments and then dealing with the individual regions. So that is, uh, those are the few challenges that we're seeing our artisan communities are facing right now. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit more about one of the, um, the other community that we work with, which is a sewing house. It's a, so, it's a small sewing house in Jakarta. Um, and we, we like working with them for our apparel because most of their workforce come from regional villages um, in search for, of employment in Jakarta. And with this sewing house, these employees essentially get given accommodation, food and training, and they can then send their incomes back to the villages for their families. However, since COVID-19, um, well, firstly, they've had to stop their uh, full workforce because of the social distancing. And I think for the first few months of COVID-19 being impacting uh, Indonesia around February and March, they were trying to essentially gear their production more towards uh, so-called COVID-19 relevant items like masks and coveralls. Uh, but Obviously, those demands are very, very low, and a lot of uh, fashion brands that used to produce with them are currently also on halt for their production. So since about three weeks ago, um, the workers have been essentially released on holiday from work, and many of them have returned to their villages in time for Hari Raya. So while it's good that they get to spend the festivities with their families, what this means is that all these workers are a um, sort of ignoring the government lockdown policy and B, they are raising the, uh, the possibility of infection and the virus being brought back and exposed to the other villagers that they're exposed to. Um, so it's sort of like a, it's, a, it's sort of like a double whammy that they're trying to balance between still having an income or not having expenses to pay in Jakarta versus not exposing the virus to the people that uh, they, they meet in the villages. I think in terms of the sewing house, um, it's currently closed. So this is very much um, the same for a lot of the small and medium sized businesses in Indonesia. A lot of them are no longer operating. So they're taking an extended break over Hari Raya period, which normally lasts for just about a couple of weeks. I think it's normally about two weeks, but a lot of them are looking to do extended holidays right now because there simply is no point in operating because there's just no enough people and not enough supplies and demand coming in. So we as a brand still have outstanding production with them that we have committed to continuing. Uh, we haven't got any visibility in terms of when uh, production can start again or when supply will be available from the Batik artisans. Uh, but we do think that this is one of the ways that we can sort of make sure that small businesses like this sewing house that we work with still remain in operation and do not go bust out of um, up after COVID-19. So talking about uh, Brave the Front, uh, Brave the Front is a campaign that um, 
I sort of started wanting to give back to the Indonesian community. And being in Singapore, I think we're very lucky that we have access to, you know, top-notch medical assistance and we don't have to worry about um, what happens when we get infected and the level of care that we get. Um, so with a lot of the medical professionals in Indonesia, especially the ones outside of Jakarta, we are seeing a lot of reports where they are having to treat COVID-19 patients um, with makeshift PPE. So we're talking about ponchos, bin liners. So basically things that are really inadequate for treating COVID-19 positive patients. And because of this, a lot of medical deaths have also been reported. So Brave to Find is something that um, while I was the one who started it, a lot of brands in the Green Collective actually very kindly pitched in to help me sort of donate items for hampers for giveaway, um, uh, to retag and to pose and announce the stories uh, to their followers. So you can see the list of brands that we are working with on Brave the Front campaign here. Um, and essentially, we ran that for about four weeks and we were able to raise about $5,000, um, Singapore dollars, uh, which will go towards an Indonesian nonprofit called the Doctor Share. And they've got 10 years of experience of just providing medical relief and aid to the remote regions of Indonesia. So this $5,000, while it might sound quite little for us, um, that actually amounts to over 50 million Indonesian rupiah. And this will be donated towards the purchase of medical PPEs to, uh, that we will then be sent to hospitals outside of Jakarta, which are not as well equipped as the ones in the capital. So again, $5,000 doesn't sound very much to us, but 53 million Indonesian rupiah is actually enough to purchase 107 sets of PPE kits for doctors in this hospital. And that basically includes things like hazmat suits, goggles, visors, and boots, um, which we believe that while we aren't able to um, impact and help every single one of the artisans that we work with, the reason why we want to help the medical professionals is because we feel that um, this care will also be extended to the wider community, especially outside of Jakarta, who may not have such good access to medical care. Um, yeah, and I've added a, a picture of a groceries, um, a bag, bags of groceries at the bottom. Um, and that's because uh, one of the new initiatives that we're trying to do as well is um, within our own time, we try to donate towards people who are uh, raising money for, um, communities or households who aren't able to afford basic groceries like oil, um, vegetables, rice, um, and the money goes towards providing sets of these items and they will then be given out to people on the street like your street sweepers or your, um, uh, your, your grab drivers, so people who may have had their income impacted because of the downturn in economy. So that's what we've been doing and the artisan communities that we've been working with. Uh, Mayur, should I pass it back to you? Yes, thanks, Steph. And I think uh, one of the most interesting things which I was going to ask you anyways later was the impact of Raya, because Raya is such a high point in the Indonesian um, calendar that yeah. the impact of it is not just direct in terms of the Raya sales, but also towards the rest of the year. So maybe yeah. we'll circle back to it. Uh, one interesting point you talked about was uh, migrants, and uh, we have Laksh with us over here, who runs a brand called Desi Hangover. Uh, Laksh, you can get on with the presentation, and Laksh has communities, uh, artisan communities he works with in India, which has seen one of the most massive migration crisis, if I call it, can call it, ever. <laughs> but uh, Laksh, in that environment, how have you been coping up? Uh, the screen is all yours. Hi, thanks, Mayur. Uh... First of all, congratulations, Amy and uh, Steph. You guys have been doing some amazing work. And uh, let's see how we all can collaborate and save the craft communities across. Uh, so, you know, like I'll give you a brief. Uh, we are in India. Uh, our company is based out of Mumbai. And the artisans that we impact is a village in Karnataka. And uh, like it's at the border of Maharashtra and Karnataka. Now, Maharashtra has been the worst hit place in the country. Uh, we have around 50,000 cases. There's one in my own society. So now it's no more that, you know, people are away. It's just next to us. And we've been in a complete lockdown. When we say complete lockdown, that means like no movement at all. We cannot go out of our houses. We are checked at every one kilometer. It's more like a curfew or a war, a war zone. And uh, it is indeed a little war against uh, COVID. And uh, I'll share my screen and I'll show what we've done and what we do. Uh, I'll actually just take you guys directly to our Instagram page because that pretty much reflects our journey and how we've uh, you know, uh, change. So 
here we were uh, in the month of uh, feb and march uh, trying to promote the shoes that we make uh, telling about the story of our best sellers and hot favorites sharing all the designs and sharing the story of the women and the men who make these shoes so we have around 50% women and 50% men uh, workforce ratio in the village there are around 70 artisans that directly work with us so that entire village cluster has around 1000 artisans and the entire bigger area would have around 10000 of them we directly impact 70 of them and the others still stay in the village and still do the, follow the same craft of shoe making not exactly our kind of shoes but again the same art and you know we talked about recycling upcycling and refashioning and then suddenly uh, as we reached here march entered and when march happened we realized that you know like what are we going to do because you know everything was shut and everything was actually uh, being transferred from being a work economy to people saving their lives to the artisans at their home and it was a very uh, you know trembling situation even for us we were like will we be able able to save our artisans or will we be in a position wherein you know we can ensure that all of our artisans are just getting at least the basics and you know how their livelihoods are going to be so it was a lot of uh, tension that we had and uh, so we sat down and we me and my business partners and a few other uh, colleagues of ours and we started thinking what can we do differently so we took one conscious call that for the month of april and may we will not be selling a single pair of shoes uh what we would rather be doing is we would rather be helping these communities uh in terms of keeping their morale high ensuring all the essentials are delivered to them uh now when i say essentials i'm not necessarily talking about you know providing food to the people because that's not enough there are women who work with us so there are sanitation needs that are different there are kids that these families have they still are not going to school but they might need some stationery so the demands and the needs are very different and they go beyond food and we thought uh, we then started calling off all of our artisans and we asked them that you know what are the monthly needs or expenses that they have and we came down to a figure that we have enough money to keep them buoyant for the next 3 months so even if they don't work we can ensure that we are at least to these 70 artisans we are providing enough that they don't have to you know go out and feel uh, scared about anything so that's how the next 2 months started looking like and you know we started working and giving out contributions to all of them Uh, now these artisans came back to us and told us that you know there are several others who don't directly work with us but they are in distress and you know and we thought that you know it's sort of a moral responsibility that if you're helping a few let's help the majority group for that we launched this uh, fundraising campaign uh, this fundraising campaign is for $10000 it was released a week ago uh, and we've already raised close to $4000 out of it uh now this is again our customers are you know people who are there in the community so there are 41 people who have contributed to it uh the campaign aims are a very simple thing that there are around 3000 artisans in that uh, major cluster and out of them 800 are under distress those are uh, either widow women uh, or uh, people who have uh, walking or working disabilities or kids who don't have parents so basically people who don't who cannot have a source of saving and are the worst at during the crisis so you recognize those families and what we are doing is that we are providing them with you know essentials with whatever they need so we are not giving them a uh, food package what we've done is that we've tied up with uh, shops like this it's called a grahak bazaar and what what we've done it that we've given each artisan a credit which is stored with that uh, shopkeeper now why are that credit these artisans can go on a regular basis and buy whatever they might require over this pandemic so they don't even have to come back to us obviously we are keeping a strict accounting and record of it and we will be sharing it with people who are contributing so say around 3000 rupees uh, which is around 60 dollars per artisan is uh, per artisan family is enough for an entire month so you know people who are contributing to that so we have started to share uh, whatever impact those people are creating as soon as all of these artisans pick the stuff up so they are free to choose whatever they have to choose uh, and you know that's how these people are doing and people have been you know contributing very generously which has been great and me and my partners had also taken a conscious decision of not taking any salaries for 3 months which is april may and june so all of our salaries have also gone towards this initiative and uh, that's where we started and a lot of people in our company also have taken a pay cut to do that so kudos to all of them uh, but then we realized that this is not a long term solution you know fundraise is a small town you can short term you can benefit people you can ensure they are buoyant but then things have to start and things have to go back into action so you know the third and the most important part of our community is other fellow brands and so we started this swadeshi campaign 
uh, Swadeshi is nothing but an uh, Indian version of buy local. Uh, it was first coined by Mahatma Gandhi uh, in the year nine, in the early 1940s and the late 1930s. Uh, so as you know, everyone in the family, when we are struck, we look up to our parents to find a solution. We looked up to the father of our nation, which is Mahatma Gandhi, and looked at what he did when India was in a crisis. Uh, so what we've done in this campaign is that uh, we've stopped promoting anything about Desi Hangover. We are rather getting an other smaller. So this is a brief about what the campaign is. So you can go to our Instagram page, look at it. And what we've started to do is now we are promoting. I'll just come to that. So let's see. So we are promoting other small businesses. So what we are doing is that there are businesses who are really in a lot of distress. So we had written to a lot of them and asked them, you know, what is their situation and how are they dealing with things? So the ones that we've realized that really need our support and, you know, we could support, help them promote and help them sell their products. Uh, they are, they are selling it themselves. We are just sharing it with our community. So we have around eight to 10,000 customers. So we're sharing it with them that, you know, these are other brands that you can buy. And, you know, this is the most important part of our community because now we feel that all of these brands need to come together and promote each other so that cross selling gets better. Uh, people who are supporting one brand also get an opportunity to explore the other. So that is what this Swadeshi movement is all about. Uh, so we've started it. We've currently already promoted 10 brands. We try to promote at least one brand each day. So today it's a company called, yesterday it was a company called Delhi Vintage Company. And uh, Today, the brand that we are promoting is uh, called Upcycled Universe. Oh, sorry, it's called Patch Over Patch. So Patch Over Patch uh, does things from upcycled fabric. So we are not limited to, you know, even clothes or anything. So any brand who feels that they need some exposure and we can help them. So we had thought that that could be a great way to promote each other and uh, get the entire situation out of the COVID crisis. So yeah, that's what we've majorly done. So three pointers to take away. We decided consciously that we would not be doing any sales because the situations were not conducive. And our village entirely depends upon sales from the shoes that we make. Uh, so then we decided that, you know, can we keep them buoyant and active? So that was step one. So our artisans are safe and happy. The second is what about the other people who are in distress? So we are doing that fundraiser through which we are promoting and supporting all of those families. And uh, Milab, the organization where we are doing the fundraiser has been kind enough that they're not charging us any fee to do the fundraiser and they're rather supporting us in the initiative. And the third thing that we've done is that now when we have to bounce back, so we need to work and come together as a community and promote each other's brands. So we try to initiate this for Desi 2.0 or 0.20 as it's written here. And we're trying to promote each other and all, all the other brands who fit into this category and slowly and gradually make a larger community who's, you know, fighting it together and hand in hand with whatever we can do for each other. So, yep, that's pretty much about what we've done at Desi Hangover. That's just amazing, Lakshay. Uh, uh, I like the way that you presented. And for everyone uh, on the webinar, I put the link for the fundraiser in the chat so you can always access it. Um, I'm conscious of the time, as usual, managing the webinar. It always goes a bit overboard. But I think one question that we got uh, was about, uh, and I can put it to all of three of you, and maybe Lakshu, you have your mic on, so I'll start with you. Um, uh, in general, considering these artisan uh, groups that you're working with, uh, what percentage of income is highly in, uh, dependent on uh, commerce versus I would stretch it to what percentage, of, uh, what percentage of livelihood is actually dependent on commerce, which is a different thing than income in most artisan economies? Uh, so in our artisan community, 100% of their income is dependent upon the shoes that they make, uh, especially so India has different uh, segments of people who make certain things. So this particular segment does not have any uh, land where they farm or any other source of income. The only source of income is the craft and the skill that they have. So 100% of their livelihood is dependent upon the craft. And at a larger level, Laksh, because India, if I remember my numbers last time, I think Asia could be estimated to have around 200 million households uh, mm -hmm. impacted by the craft or the artisan economy. Um, how, how has it been for the rest of the craft economies? Because they can get even very remote in many cases. So, you know, the problem that has happened is that uh, India was in a phase of transformation transition, wherein uh, a lot of these uh, people, uh, you know, like were being transferred from an agriculture economy to a small business or a craft based economy where, you know, businesses were coming up into conscious fashion and give providing a lot of livelihoods in this region that happened in the past three years. 
and you know the standard of living of these artisans was going up the income levels were going up and they, definitely their demands of day to day living was going up and now suddenly there's a halt and uncertainty so what has happened is that a lot of these artisans are not even sure when they're going to get their work back you know so it's and their standard of living has gone up because suddenly they, there was demand for their goods which used to be in existence 5 to 10 years back so because of a drastic spike that had come up there is a large fall that has happened and they are currently at a stage where they are very very uncertain talking about very remote areas so what has happened is that a lot of people from who were laborers in the cities like mumbai and delhi and you know a lot of migrant laborers over there have gone back to their villages so the burden on the villages is increasing earlier how a village runs in india is that they depend on agriculture as a village economy some of them depend on craft and there is some income that comes from their relatives who work in the city so the people in the cities have gone back so they don't have a livelihood the crops have drastically come down and now there is a locust attack across india where in the crops are getting destroyed now because of that they are very 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 adversely hit and especially the higher up regions say you know now monsoon is approaching monsoon is really strong in india so because of monsoon now what's going to happen is there are a lot of communities which stop producing or stop making things so they've not actually lost the quarter they've lost two quarters and the only time they'll be able to even revive production is after the second quarter like our quarter starts in april so they'll again resume work only in the month of uh, say uh, september or october so you know that's how it has impacted india as a larger scale yeah i'll just build on that question and take some of the questions that we are getting and i'll put it to steph uh, uh steph you talked about the same thing which laksh is talking about the migration issue um on the consumer side which is i guess everyone on this webinar do you are you do you feel hopeful that the conscious consumption will be more mainstream in the post pandemic world do you see uh, people changing habits or adopting more of sustainable and products which basically create an actual impact um if i'm being 100% honest i don't really I think the impact will be limited to be honest. I mean even if we look at habits that are happening right now in this COVID pandemic, I think people have actually become less sustainable because they're so worried about hygiene, right? So we we're we're reusing things less. We're bringing we're taking new uh containers from from restaurants or takeaway food for example. Um so I think there is obviously the opportunity to be more compassionate. I I can only hope that it doesn't just stay within this co- within this COVID period. Um I think some people are probably also getting a lot of charity fatigue because of the amount of negative news that's happening in in the media as well so I think you know we as brands need to be a lot more sensitive about uh if we're doing any charity not kind of having that full on blast 24/7 uh and having striking a good balance between selling and also between doing good uh via our causes um yeah I mean it, Yeah, I mean I want to be hopeful but to be honest I I think it's going to take you know what they say like habits take 30 days to form right but I think especially being sustainable takes a lot longer to form so people need to be very conscious of their habits even beyond this pandemic period. No, I think that's that's actually being realistic so it's good to hear because I think for every brand especially in sustainability there's a lot of talk about uh good weather and the Venice canals looking much prettier. but uh we having having worked in the space as brand owners we know sometimes reality is different but step yeah. in your case i will ask the same question i asked laksh that how much percentage uh, in case of indonesian craftsmen how much percentage of livelihood is actually uh, dependent on craft income purely i mean for people who are doing crafts they're doing it as their full time job so if you think about it it's just you know we're so we're brand owners for example that's our main source of income this is their job right so they do this and especially for a lot of the craft people that we work with they've been doing this for generations so their families were doing it their parents were doing it um a lot of, for a lot of them is 100% of income being dependent on crafts um and a it's very difficult to find another income channel when for example you haven't gone through school or education isn't so uh it maybe not seen as important or or just uh, it, people don't go to the same levels of education as we do in the villages so the income alternatives are very difficult for them um a lot of the girls that we work with for the weavers for example um 
uh, if they don't do weaving, they probably would have gone to other income channels like being a domestic helper or working in a factory. So which is why we think crafts is very, very important because it gives them a, a different lifestyle that they can still get money from without having to leave their families or without having to leave the country for years and years on end. Um, so yeah, for a lot of them, it's 100% and it's severely impacted right now because of the lack of tourism and just lack of spending in general. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what makes the problem more, much more complicated than what it actually And uh, Emmy, I would like to get some uh, closing views from you because we're already two minutes over time. And um, about the, the dependency of the Laotian artisans and the communities that you're working with on income via crafts. And uh, also, yeah, what more can people in this webinar who've taken 45 minutes of the time today to listen to the efforts and the actual issue, issues on the ground, what can they do today? Uh, well, I think one thing you've got to realize is Laos is only 7 million people. So we're in a really fortunate situation. I'm sure we're landlocked. So there's been, um, no like trade coming trade and everything stopped and they went you know we can't send anything out via post um but in saying that um it's our the way our village artisans work is that they're working with not just me they're working with many different people most of the the village artisans that are that successful they um will have different uh, markets the one the lantern community that um in the north that we're Doing the uh, looking at doing the sewing project for they don't have anyone else and so they're probably um, they're probably impacted in the sense that they're going back to just sort of more sustainable lifestyle. They most of the villages I work with have rice uh, from last season. They'll be planting rice in July um, for the next season. So during this wet season, uh, it sort of finishes up in October when they harvest. It's a slow season anyway. Um, so yeah, Laos is a very fortunate picture because Laos has always, the people have always just gone back to the land and they have the space and they have the land. Um, and they're incredibly resilient people. In saying that, sure, there are some urban poor, but in terms of our artisans, um, the income from handicraft in some villages might be as high as maybe 60%. But in most, in the more remote areas, probably about 10 to 20. So, you know, they're not, it's, it's, it's quite different, you know. It's hard to just put a label across the whole country and what we do. Um, and in terms of sustainability, um, you know, I've, I've got a different picture, I suppose, because I sit sort of in this island in Laos and I'm not in Singapore at the moment. And um. I've just had so much support from around the world. It's been really wonderful. So I sort of got the feeling that, I mean, I know it's a community that we talk to a lot, but I do have a positive feeling that um, people like Australia's going into a recession, America will be going to a recession. And I think in these wealthy countries that people will just stop buying so much. So hopefully we can help. We can, I think we have a big chance to get the message across that, buy less, but make an impact more. I think it's also mostly buy less and buy better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great line to end the webinar in as well. Um, my appeal to everyone attending the webinar is to please visit uh, these brands online, learn to get to know about their work. You can even go to the Green Collective website get to know about them. Uh, if you could just help us uh, with the feedback on the session before you could leave. So you could just press, uh, give us a rating on the overall session uh, between one to five, with uh, five being the best, one being the worst, so that we can continue to keep coming up with new webinars. But uh, as that voting happens, let me just thank Steph, Femi and Lakshya. I think what you guys are doing is amazing. Uh, and uh, our job is to bring to forth what you guys are doing and we'll continue to keep doing that to our best ability. Uh, and yeah, good luck to all of us. And uh, to everyone joining, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, we're bringing more webinars now since uh, in spite of the circuit breaker in Singapore getting lifted off, uh, Green Collective is still not going to open. So, but that doesn't mean that we will stop talking. We will still keep talking and keep advocating because that's our job to do.
So, so stay tuned and uh, see you again for another webinar. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good evening, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye.